Well, as the home of the place that says there's no such thing as a free lunch, you're going to have to listen to me to, to get your lunch. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the topic of the talk is the Keynes solution uh, to our current economic problems, not only domestically but internationally. And of course, in 40 minutes, I'm not going to cover the whole thing, but I'm going to point you to some things. For more than three decades, policymakers and government, central bankers, They've, some variant of classical economic theory has, has motivated them, and they've argued that government regulation of markets and large government spending policies are the cause of all our economic problems, and ending big government and freeing markets, especially financial markets, uh, both domestically and internationally, will solve all our economic problems. Uh, and we even heard some of that in the debate last night. Uh, now, However, uh, since 1980, governments and, uh, have been deregulating and reducing the size of government relative to the GDP. And also there has been an argument which economists have used that monetary policy is the only game in town. Fiscal policy, fiscal stimulus doesn't work. Monetary policy works. And you know, uh, the Fed has now introduced what is called QE, qualitative easing, which has been pumping an awful lot of money into the economy. Why? To stimulate the economy. Interestingly enough, uh, Keynes wrote a letter to Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s when Roosevelt was trying to do the same thing. He devalued the dollar and then bought gold in from everybody so that there was a lot more money in the, uh, in the hands of the public because the argument was as good uh, quantity theorists would say, if you gave people more money, they'd go out and spend it, and that would stimulate the economy. It didn't work, and Keynes said to, wrote in this letter to, to Roosevelt, well, you see, the problem with, with that idea is if you want to get fat, buy a bigger belt. That's the, the quantitative easing argument. Uh, that doesn't help you get fat, but it may help you drop your pants. Uh, in any case, in, 19, in 2007, we had this global meltdown uh, and a great recession, although the National Bureau of Economic Research has said that the recession has ended, okay, and we're now out of the recession. I should point out that in the Great Depression, which started in 1929, uh, all historians say it lasted until the Second World War in 1940s. That was even though from 1933 to 1936, we had rapid economic growth in the United States before we had a second recession in 1937-38. Why? Because Roosevelt, people told Roosevelt, uh, if you, the, the national debt to GDP ratio had risen dramatically. It was up to 40% of the GDP. And in those days, uh, conservatives said, if uh, it went much above 25%, the government would go bankrupt. So in 1930, for the fiscal year 1937, Roosevelt cut government spending practically in half, actually ran a surplus uh, in, the, in the budget, and the economy collapsed at the end of 1937, early 38. We were back to where we were in 1929. Then Roosevelt started spending again. So the fact that NBER has said the recession has ended, if you take history as an example, uh, they would have said, the recession had ended in 1935 under Roosevelt, not the Great Depression, I should say. Now, in testimony before Congress on October 23, 2008, uh, Green, Alan Greenspan said that he had overestimated the ability of free financial markets to self-govern and correct uh, themselves. And he said, and I quote, I still do not understand why it happened, and obviously, to the extent that I figure it happened, why it happened, I shall change my views. Uh, he then said the intellectual edifice, uh, based on, by the way, a PhD uh, from Chicago, shows, uh, the intellectual edifice of risk management uh, has collapsed. And this risk management uh, edifice uh, was supposed to prevent financial collapses. Even though uh, Scholes, uh, in, as a partner in, in the long-term management uh, group in 19, uh, uh, 1999, uh, they collapsed, with Scholes being one of the partners. 
Greenspan says, if I find out, I'll, I'll change my views. Well, one of the purposes of my talk is to convince Greenspan and others what went wrong and why they ought to change their views. Now, the answer to that is very simple, at least to me, maybe not to anybody else, and that is Keynes had a theory of liquidity, and the post-Keynesian analysis explains why laissez-faire financial markets uh, cannot be efficient and do not solve the problem that they are claimed to solve. I'm, most of you are undergraduate students. How many of you, your professors, have told you that financial markets optimally allocate capital? Oh, that's all? There's two or three people who haven't heard that yet? Okay. Well, if they optimally allocate capital, what happened in the uh, dot-com bubble, and real estate bubble, and what have you? We'll get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, the Keynes also, using the same principles in the general theory, presented a plan called the Keynes Plan at Bretton Woods, in which he argued that free trade, flexible exchange rates, and free international capital fund mobility across countries was incompatible with the economic goal of global full employment and uh, prosperity. And, uh, okay, so we'll talk a little bit how why these this thing is incompatible. Again, I'm sure in most of your classes, you've learned that the way to, uh, and even President Obama thinks that we get out of the recession if all we have is more free trade agreements with other countries and people start buying made in America, more made in America goods, we'll get ourselves out of this unemployment uh, problem, as President Obama said last night. Now, <coughs> Nevertheless, since the 1970s, which is 40 years now, almost a half a century, put that in perspective, certain things that have happened which mainstream economic theory says cannot happen. For example, the U.S. government, the United States rather, has run a persistent trade deficit for over 40 years. That is, we have imported more than we exported. Countries that pr pursued export-led growth policies to obtain what what economic historians would call a mercantilist favorable balance of trade, have been called economic miracles. For example, Japan in the 1980s and 90s, China in the last decade or so, despite the fact that Japan, after being such an economic miracle, has run two decades of recession. And I suspect uh, Germany is another example, by the way. And I suspect these other countries like China and Germany are going into recession as well. But favorable balance of trades is something that can't happen in the free uh, market environment for reasons we'll talk about later. Why, what about all these bubbles? Again, if financial markets are efficient, there shouldn't be any bubbles. And finally, let me talk about uh, for a second, uh, outsourcing and offshoring. This has created unemployment in the United States, despite what Mr. Romney says, uh, and actually has lowered the real income of American workers. Uh, but that's in contrast to what you've again learned in your class on the law of comparative advantage, which says what? The nation with the cheap labor, don't get those industries that use cheap labor, labor in the other country, the United States, will have higher real wages. Okay, uh, of course, law of comparative advantage assumes this f uh, full employment at all times, among other things. So why hasn't uh, this occurred? Okay, now, how do we know the future? Uh, all of this, uh, if you're going to efficiently allocate resources, you've got to know what the payout is in the future. Time is a device which prevents everything from happening at once. So if you make an economic decision today, the payoff is going to be tomorrow, next week, next year, uh, 10 years down. Investment goods takes a long time, but even a consumption good. Uh, you came here hoping to have a good lecture and get so many utiles of happiness out of this. Whether you do or not, you really can't tell. Only after the fact will you be able to know. Uh, if you buy a car, refrigerator, after the fact, the, you'll know how many flow of utiles uh, you, you're going to get. Now, what these risk management uh, uh, programs 
that Wall Street have used, attempt to forecast the future of financial assets and uh, use big computer models power, uh, produced by high-powered physicists and statisticians. And supposedly, they are supposed to predict with actuarial uncertainty what the future outcome of any financial asset should be. Now, this assumes these risk management models are based on scientific methodology, which measures the probabilities calculated from past data. And these probabilities can be pooled, managed, and tamed to predict the future. Unfortunately, uh, these risk management models have turned out to, these computer models turned out to be weapons of math destruction, uh, as we saw with the financial collapse in 2007 and 8, which has affected the whole world. Okay, now we've learned from experience that it's hard to predict the future, despite what you may have learned in your economic classes, where if you're going to be, what does it mean to be inefficient, make efficient uh, capital decisions? There are four different investment possibilities, or five different investment possibilities. The person who makes the decision has to know what the rate of er earnings, the rate of return on each of these decisions, even though the investment may last 10 or 20 years. Well, from, you'll actually know the rate of return at the end of the investment, uh, when the investment collapses. But if you're going to be efficient, you, it is assumed that you know these before you even make the decision. Otherwise, how do you make an, a, a, an efficient allocation? So you have to be able to predict the future. Now, Keynes said those people who invent a remote reality, uh, have, and he talked mainly about classical economics, invent a reality remote from the real world and then live in it consistently, okay? uh, which is quite true. Uh, he then said that if, if, you, uh, if you live in this re uh, world uh, and you want to talk about the real world, the, uh, these economic thinkers who have this classical model are like Euclidean geometers in a non-Euclidean world who discover that apparent parallel lines often collide, rebuke the lines for not keeping straight. I assume some of you took classes in geometry and know the difference between classical and non if you stand on a railroad track and you look at the railroad, uh, tra what, what, what do you see? These lines apparently parallel meet at the horizon. And that can be explained by non-Euclidean geometry. It can't be explained. Uh, and he, he says you've got to throw over the axiom of parallels and work out a non-Euclidean geometry. And he said that's what his general theory was. A theory is more general if it has fewer restrictive axioms. Okay, the definition of an axiom is a universal truth that does not have to be proved. Keynes' uh, general theory threw out three classical axioms, and we're going to go through them now. One is the ergodic axiom, two is the neutrality of money axiom, and three is the gross substitution axiom. Now, the last two, I'm sure all of you have heard about in economics, because everything's a substitute for everything else and money is neutral, otherwise you can't have a quantity theory of money. So let me start with the ergodic axiom. Now, any statistician will tell you, in order to draw any statistical inference <coughs> regarding a uh, population universe, you should draw a sample from that population universe and then analyze it to get the moments around the mean, and then you have some information about that universe. Uh, now. If you wanted to say something about the future uh, financial markets, you have to draw a sample of, from the future. Then do your calculation of the four moments around the mean and so something like these things over here, right? Okay. Well, but it's impossible to draw a sample from the future. Anybody know how to do one from the future? Okay. So what you do is you impose something called ergodic stochastic process or the ergodic axiom. And what the ergodic axiom says, it's, it's very complicated, even more complicated than these equations. But in essence, it says, simply stated, that the same probability distribution that controlled events that happened in the past are going to control events that happen in the future. So if you draw a sample from the past, it's equivalent of drawing a sample from the future. Therefore, if you analyze the data of the sample from the past, you know 
what the future is going to be. Okay. Paul Samuelson says that if you're going to make economics a science, you must impose the ergodic axiom. So it's not only classical economists, it's a lot of American economists as well. Okay. Now, if, uh, if this was the case, then markets could be efficient because you could take fundamentals, price earning ratios, things of that sort, and, for, and forecast what the future is going to be looking at the past. Okay, but if that was the case, I ask you this following question. If you've ever seen an ad for a mutual fund, it advertises its wonderful past earnings record, right? And then it says in small print in the advertisement, past performance does not guarantee future results. Well, what does that mean? That the, even they recognize that this is a non ergodic system. So what you got from the past is no way what you're going to get in the future or may not be what you're going to get from the f in the future. Uh, but this ergodic er axiom is essential. Now, this makes a difference about if you believe the world is ergodic. Remember, an axiom is a universal truth that you don't have to prove. So you say to, to any economic theorist, do you believe the world is ergodic or is it non-ergodic? If he says it's ergodic then is it, or non-ergodic, there's a difference into what the role of government is in the economic process. Uh, for example, most, Samuelson among others, but Bob Lucas as well, and other mainstream orthodox economists have adopted either explicitly or implicitly the ergodic axiom. Why? Because they want economics to be the same hard science as astronomy. The science of astronomy is based on the ergodic axiom. And what does it mean? It means that the movement of all the heavenly bodies has been already predetermined since the age of the Big Bang until the end of the universe. So all you have to do is take measurements of the heavenly bodies in the past and then project those of in the future. And you can predict within a few seconds the next solar eclipse, right? And we know they do a great job at doing this. Now, nothing Congress, the President of the United States, the United Nations, or environmentalists can do will alter the predetermined date and time for future solar eclipses. For example, Congress cannot pass an enforceable law outlawing solar eclipses in order to provide more sunshine and therefore enhance crop production. In the ergodic world, future events are already predetermined and beyond human uh, activity, human decisions. Therefore, laissez-faire, get out of the way, let the market, I have some quotes, I had a debate with Milton Friedman, I won't bore you with the quotes from Milton, uh, it's in, his, in this book that we, were, we, among five of us, wrote Milton Friedman's Monetary Framework, in which he argues basically that the world, there's a, and you've heard this in statistics courses, there's a secular trend that goes out into the future that tells you what the economic path of the future is. The actual observation may be on one side or the other, so you have a normal distribution around that trend, but that trend is what the economy is going for. Right? That would be the long-term equilibrium, and you get short-term variations around this trend. Okay? Now, if you, uh, on the other hand, believe ergodic, economics is a non-ergodic science, then there's a role for government to try and create, because if you believe in non-ergodic, the future is created by people's decision-making today. Okay? So you can create a future which will differ, differ from the laissez-faire uh, results that will occur. And hopefully you'll create a future where it will create better results than what the laissez-faire system will be. Okay. Now, by the way, George Soros, and I'll get to him in a second, his theory of reflexivity, he rejects the ergodic axiom as well. So here's a financial manager who, who's done, been pretty successful, argues that one of the trouble with e what he, economics uh, that he thinks of is that it has the ergodic axiom. And in fact, George put up, as, as was already told, $50 million to create the INET, Institute for New Economic Theory. I'm proud to say that a friend of mine, uh, Bill Janeway, who's also an investment banker, then put up another $100 million. So it's now $150 million still growing because they reject the ergodic axiom. Now, from the history of mankind, 
humans believe that something determines the future. For centuries, it was the design of God. If you said, why did that tree fall down? It was God's design. Why did so-and-so die? Why did so-and-so fall in love and whatever? It was one of the gods, either Diana or the single god, depending on what your religion was. And it was only in the 17th century, which we call the Age of Enlightenment, where we argued that reason, rather than thinking everything depends on the gods, will tell you what causes things to occur. So Sir Isaac Newton saw an apple falling from the tree, and he designs a theory of gravity. Okay? Uh, Darwin sees all these different species, and he designs theory of evolution. Notice the Darwin's theory of evolution is non-ergotic. It tells you what's happened in the past, but it doesn't tell you what the next species is going to be. Is it scientific? Well, I leave those who believe in creationism to decide whether it's scientific or not. All right. Now, the theory is a, what is a theory? It's just a, a set of axioms in which you then follow logical procedures to get to conclusions, and you tell the public this is what's going to happen. You don't tell them how you got there. You don't tell them what the axioms are. But you tell them, if the Federal Reserve increases the quantity of money, prices have to go up. Why? Well, that's because you assume the money is neutral. If you assume money is not neutral, and one of the Keynes in 1933 specifically said, money is not neutral either in the short run or the long run. When I told this to Milton, he said, well, in the short run, he's probably right, but not in the long run. Okay. And of course, Keynes' answer to that would have been, well, in the long run, we'll all be dead, so we'll never know whether it is or not. OK, now, if the facts conflict with economic theory, because one or more fundamental axioms are flawed and should be discarded as a different theory can be built. The alternative would be to change the facts, or even one's definitions of the facts, to, fit this unre to, to support this unrealistic theory. And I must admit, sometimes in academia and in Washington, that's what happens. I have a quote from Milton Freeman, by the way, uh, again, about the permanent th theory of permanent income. Any of you have ever heard of this theory of permanent income? Milton Freeman, how does he define savings? Anybody remember? You all know? Yeah. Savings is defined as, uh, well, consumption is defined as a flow of utility. So if you buy a non-durable, you consume the whole thing immediately. If you buy a durable, the amount of it that is consumed is how much utility you get in this particular counting period, and you save the rest of the utility over the life of the thing. So Milton argues, if you buy a yacht or a car, it's mostly savings, because it's going to last a long time. And therefore, savings creates jobs. And he boasts on page 12 of his book, his theory is better because it, can, it defines savings in a way that most people would not define savings. Okay? Now, so he gets his theory of permanent income from this, uh, because if you buy, and he says, suppose you win the lottery, you're going to save it all, right? Remember permanent income, a windfall income, you don't. Why are you going to save it all? He says, well, if you win a million dollars in the lottery, how much of that are you going to spend on wine, women, and song? Uh, most of it, you're going to buy a yacht, a durable. So almost all of it is going to be saved. So the marginal propensity to consume out of, permanent, out of a windfall income is close to zero. Uh, but it does create jobs. All right. Now, finally, one further thing. We must recognize that the aim of science is to understand processes that are occurring in the world about us, prediction about future events may not be possible. It's certain methodologies can achieve such a, but it is not a goal of science itself. Explanation. Darwin's explanation doesn't predict the future. Okay? So science need not be able to predict the future. If you believe the particular science that you're studying is non ergodic then you cannot predict the future. Now, let's talk about econ economists. Ricardian theory says, Assumed everybody knew the future. And Ricardo, the future is perfect certainty and so on and so forth. So Ricardo gets all these results. Uh, how about rational expectations? It assumes that you have a probability distribution which is 
equal to the objective probability distribution that's going to govern the future. So in essence, you have an actuarial certainty again. Okay? And the question is, uh, is that a good assumption to make? Or can you make an assumption that people know that they do not know the future? If they, do, if they know they do not know the future, then how do they make decisions? And here's where Keynes comes in. By the way, I should point out that uh, John Hicks, does anybody know who John Hicks was? My goodness, your education has been terribly... Uh, he's a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he invented the so-called ISLM uh, system, which Martin Brent from Brenner called the Islamic religion of economists. Uh, because at one point in time, everybody put their macroeconomic theories. Even Milton Friedman, in his debate with Jim Tobin, puts his theory in terms of ISLM. Well, John Hicks and I became friends, and I told him about the ergodic axiom and so on and so forth. And I finally got him to, publish, uh, to write an article, which I published in the journal uh, Post Keynesian Economics, saying, the ISLM is not Keynes. It's a terrible mistake. I'm sorry I did it. And then he says uh, in a letter to me, with this thing, he says, uh, the word ergodic, non-ergodic is wonderful. I should have adopted my view of economics as non-ergodic. And so he, he then became a non-ergodic economist. Two other Nobel Prize winners have accepted this view. One is uh, uh, Doug North, who once explained processes of economic change. And he says, economic change can only occur if the world is non-ergodic, otherwise it's the future is already predetermined, and Bob Solo. Now, I, I said in this book, in this article, that this is a, that Keynes not only has these solutions, but it's a very serious monetary theory. And of course, here in Chicago, we have monetary theory. So let me quote Arrow and Hahn in their book, General Competitive Economics. And they write, and I quote, the term in which contracts are made matter. And particularly, if money is the goods in terms of which contracts are made, then the price of goods in terms of money are of special significance. This is not a case if we consider an economy without a past or a future. If a serious monetary theory comes to be written, the fact that contracts are made in terms of money will be of considerable importance." Unquote. Now, Keynes's liquidity theory is, in these words, a serious monetary theory for domestic and international transactions because it emphasizes the use of money contracts as a way of coping with an uncertain future. Why, do, why is that so? Well, why do you enter into money contracts? All of you, even as students, you rent something. You have, uh, hopefully you have some stipend from the university or from dad or somebody uh, to pay the rent. Well, what do you do when you, you enter contracts for contractual cash outflows, that fixes your contractual cash outflows over a period of time, depending on the length of the contract. Then if you're working, you have an employment contract which says you're going to get a certain amount of cash inflows, or dad says you're going to get a certain amount of cash inflows. And the whole, what you spend all your time worrying about is will the inflows match the outflows. As long as there's contractual commitments on both sides, you have a legal, reasonable guarantee that there will be Control, you have some control of the cash flow of your system, and as long as you have the contracts flowing in, exceeding the flow out, you're in good shape, right? It's when the flow out exceeds the flow in, you've got a problem. Now, uh, and the liquidity concept is, says that if you're liquid, you can meet all your contractual obligations as they come up in the future, okay? Now, the sanctity of money contracts is the essence of the capitalist system, and it's the essence of Keynes' theory. Uh, some of you may have learned Samuelson's theory, which is uh, that Keynes got unemployment because he assumed rigid wages and prices. Uh, I pointed out to Milton Friedman that that's not the case, and he has a little footnote in his debate with me saying, well, Davidson says this, but, you know, what does Davidson know? Uh, okay. Now, If you have a, if you have a, you watch your checkbook, all of you, watch your checkbook all the time and watch to see that you always have a positive balance. If your outflows start increasing 
faster than your inflows, what do you do to, to prevent becoming illiquid and ultimately insolvent and bankrupt? A, you stop entering into contractual obligations for fast, for, for future outflows. You reduce your contractual outflow obligation. B, you uh, get a loan, line of credit from the bank. Or C, you have a liquid asset that you sell for money so you can make your contractual obligations. This comes to the question of liquidity. What is a liquid asset? This table is an asset. It provides you tiles of happiness and savings, according to Milton Friedman, because it's going to be here for years. Okay. Is it liquid? Why not? You can't sell it. There's no market. So liquid assets are things that sold on a, mar a market, what I call a liquid market. And Keynes and so on argued about this, provided this question, OK? Now, in our society, no one can be too handsome, too beautiful, or too liquid, OK? And the more we fear the future, the more we fear that there may something happen which will have, create a contractual obligation that I can't meet, the more we want to be liquid. The greater the fear of the future, the more liquidity as a cushion to prevent us from having an adverse problem. Of course, nothing hurts more than not being able to meet your bills. Ultimately, you go bankrupt, right? And bankruptcy is like a walk to the gallows. Although my friend Alan Meltzer, anybody know how, who Alan is? Anybody know? Nobody here has ever heard of him. <laughs> Alan and I, I are good friends. We were graduate students together and so on and so forth. Alan keeps telling me, bankruptcy is good for the capitalist system. Why? Well, it sort of gets rid of all the rottenness in the system, see? And after all, he convinced Mitt, Mitt Romney, right? As you learned yesterday in the, in the debate, Mitt Romney wrote an article and said that General Motors and Chrysler and Ford ought to go bankrupt and then get restructured for the marketplace, and that was a much better system than Obama bailing out the, the uh, Detroit. Uh, Al and I will never agree on these things, uh, but we were both, by the way, we were both disagreed with Milton in this book. Okay, now, the primary function of a well-organized and orderly financial market is to provide liquidity. Now, in such a market, anybody who owns a financial asset knows that they can make a fast exit whenever they want to liquefy their portfolio, right? You pick up the phone, or now you click a computer, you tell your broker, sell, within 30 seconds he comes back, you're sold, okay? It's a liquid market. Now, and the price that he sells at is not much different than the last price that you saw on the ticker tape. So it's, it, prices aren't fixed, but they move in orderly manner, up or down. Okay? Now, uh, how do they, well, in order to have an orderly market, Keynes and the post-Keynesian argue, you have to have an institution called a market maker. What is this market maker? It is somebody, some institution, usually private sector institution, which makes the market. So that if more people are, if the bulls and the bears just about offset each other, the market maker just matches up orders and helps execute and he gets a commission usually on every order he does. But if suddenly a lot of people are rushing to the exit and there are very few bills buying, the market maker is supposed to step in, not to fix the price, but to make sure the price goes down in an orderly manner so it permits other people to exit reasonably fast. Okay, bond dealers in, in New York are a good example of that. Uh, there are 12 bond dealers in New York who make the market. And you can call up any day, or your broker can call up any day and say, what's the price of U.S. Treasury so-and-so? And they'll tell you, buy, sell, and the price will not be much different. Mostly they're, they're cu com, uh, the cut that they get. Now. What happens if the market maker cannot make the market anymore? Suppose, after all, he's a private institution. He has a lot of funds, 
Warburg or somebody like that, so he's got a lot of money, but even he can run out of money, he or she, I should say. Uh, what happens? Well, if the market starts to get disorderly, there's something called circuit breakers. Circuit breaker is, anybody ever hear that term? Circuit breaker says, suspend trading. Why do you suspend trading? Because you want the market maker to get enough resources to resume orderliness, or you want the panic to get over with, and then you want to increase trading again. But if the market maker can't resume trading, what happens? The central bank becomes the market maker of last resort and steps in and makes the market, or sh I should say does, I should say should. Okay, uh, European Central Bank has just learned that about Spanish bonds and Italian bonds, so on. Uh, our bank has learned that when these uh, d crazy derivatives and other things, uh, they had to step in and buy these things, okay, to prevent. Uh, now, let's talk about this mar market, mortgage-backed derivative financial markets. They're well organized because a private investment banker makes the market. He announces every day, you know, what, what he expects the price to be. But he's not the market maker. He's not going to stay in no matter what happens. Nevertheless, the mar these mortgage-backed derivatives were advertised as, quote, good as, go good as cash, I should say, better than gold, good as cash. And they were triple A rated by the rating agencies, which says you can sell them like that, no problem. Price is going to be orderly. And therefore, banks and financial institutions and even people around the globe bought these things. Why? Because they had a higher yield than other things, and they were safe. Until some prime mortgage problem occurred, and some of these derivatives, which were very complicated uh, assets, which had thousands of mortgages in there, and nobody really knew whose mortgage. I mean, the problem with mortgages is you've got to know who the borrower is. Some of you have seen uh, It's a Good Life. What did James, Jimmy Stewart play in It's a Good Life? Anybody remember? He was an SNL banker. And he said, you make loan. In, in those days, mortgages were illiquid loans. When the banker made the loan, he was stuck with the loan until you either defaulted or you paid the thing off. Okay? And how did you decide on who to make the loan? Well, Jimmy uh, Stewart said, well, three things. There's collateral, what the thing is worth. There's uh, credit history, how good have these people been in paying back their previous loans, and then this character. Are these people honest and so on and so forth? But now these mortgage-backed derivatives took an illiquid acid and made it liquid. These are alchemists that turned lead into gold. Okay? Now, when they became illiquid, there was no market maker, the market for the, this particular assets dropped. And also for other derivatives. I don't know whether my derivative is any good, but his derivative has just gone bankrupt. I'm going to get out. So there was a herd behavior rushing to the exit. And everybody rushed to the exits. What happens to the value of, the, of these, these securities? Nothing. And then we have an accounting rule that says mark to market. On, the, on your balance sheet, you're carrying these assets what do you carry them at? The market price. If the market price is zero, that doesn't do very much. You become insolvent and ultimately go bankrupt. Okay? So that's the problem. Uh, liquidity is important. Central bank has to guarantee liquidity if it's going to avoid financial crises. In big markets, I mean, you know, there may be some little tiny market. In fact, when SNL broke out, you didn't need the central bank, the Federal Home Savings and Loan, and, and um, I forget the, uh, the first Bush set up a company, I forget now what its name is, that, that handled these, took these bad loans off the books uh, by buying them. And Res then, Resolution Trust Company. What was it? Resolution Trust, Resolution Trust Company, right. Which is the same thing, making the market. Okay, now, for Keynes, savings is always a reduction in effective demand for goods and services. Why? Well, Keynes said there were, he has a chapter 17 in the general theory called Essential Properties of Interest and Money. Essential properties. When I asked Paul Samuelson, did you ever read the chapter? He says, no, why should I? 
And I asked Milton Friedman, he said, he said, oh, there's some interesting things in these last chapters, but the whole theory is solved by the time you get to chapter 15. So you really don't have to read the rest of these chapters. But Keynes said there was an essential property of interest in money. And what was that? He said that all liquid assets, whether it be money or any other financial asset that's traded on a uh, liquid market, have two essential properties. The zero elasticity of production and the zero elasticity of substitution between liquid assets and producible goods. Now, what is the zero elasticity of production? It's a production function, for those of you who remember. Well, suppose that people suddenly decide to buy less uh, space vehicles that we call automobiles and save more to buy liquid assets. What happens? The employment in Detroit goes down, right? Because there's a less to see a production. Demand falls off, less, less inputs to produce the output. But people, if liquid asset has a less to see a production of zero, there's no place where you can hire people to produce what I call time vehicles, machines that move your purchasing power over time. So you create unemployment. Now, in, in uh, Varesian economics and general equilibrium economics, money, the numeraire, is usually a commodity. And very often it's said it's peanuts. You may, some of you may know this argument about peanuts being the numeraire. Now, if, if when President Jimmy Carter ha ran into a recession and people stopped buying automobiles, if instead they bought peanuts, what would happen? Employment in Detroit would go down, but employment in the peanut factory, in peanut farms in Alabama and Georgia and so on, would, uh, would go up. And Jimmy Carter should have named his brother Billy, who was a peanut farmer, to head the Federal Reserve rather than, uh, than the, uh, the person he did, right? So you can see if, depending on how you define savings, notice the difference. The word means two completely different things to Keynesians, or at least Keynes and post-Keynesians, as it does to Milton Friedman. To Milton Friedman, it means buying a producible durable that you're going to carry over time because you're going to get a flow of utility in the future. You're saving that utility for the future. So savings creates jobs for Milton. Savings does not create jobs for Keynes. Well, which one is right? Which, well, for the average person, they, they know when they save, if they bought a mink coat or a yacht, they wouldn't call that savings, right? So I think most people out on the street, and hopefully some people here in the, who haven't been brainwashed enough, some people here will accept the idea that savings is the purchase of liquid assets. And liquid assets have no production function with them. Okay, so you can't create jobs just because you go for liquidity. If anything, more you move uh, income out of buying goods and services and into savings, the more you create unemployment. Now, in the two minutes I got left, let me say something. Uh, I said about Soros, I won't quote him, but let me say something about international trade because there are some people who are in. Keynes, of course, was an international economist. And uh, why, do, why, do com why do governments build up their foreign reserves. China has more foreign reserves than anybody else. It's one of the biggest holders of U.S. treasuries. Why? Because they fear in the future there will be contractual commitments internationally which they will not be able to meet. So this is a question of maintaining liquidity. But just as people who save too much and don't spend enough create a problem of employment in a closed economy, countries that uh, oversave, that run mercantilist policies, run continuous, persistent trade surpluses, create global unemployment problems. And I, uh, one final question, point, and then I'll let you ask questions. Greece has got a problem. What's the solution? Well, if you read the paper that says, well, first thing is Greece ought to get out of the euro, have its own drachma, and then they could devalue the drachma. And if they devalue the drachma, Greek firms will become more competitive and they'll be able to sell more exports. Uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Geithner has a similar idea. He says the Chinese ought to raise the yuan relative to the dollar and then Obama will sell more exports, okay? The problem with that is more competitive to who? If 
you become more competitive and there's no increase in aggregate effective demand globally, it means that the other nation, the surplus nations with any surpluses are going to be less competitive and in fact some of the companies might even go bankrupt. So that doesn't solve the problem, it just is what we called in the 1930s exporting your unemployment. And we had war devaluations in the 1930s which solved nothing. So what is the solution to the problem? And I'll stop here, but the solution to the problem Keynes put in, the, in his Keynes plan to Bretton Woods, and I'll give you the solution then if you want to know where to read about it, I'll tell you to buy my book, Keynes Solution, or buy my textbook, even more important, because then you can get the whole putting together of what the difference between classical economics and post-Keynesian economics is all about. His solution was very simple. There's always going to be countries that are running persistent trade surpluses. The, you have to have an institutional arrangement that when the country runs a persistent trade surplus, it must spend its surplus on buying things from somebody else. It's equivalent to forcing Say's law. Okay, supply creates its own demand. And he had a system which does it, and I have a system that does it for the 21st century. In other words, it is the problem, the usual solution is the country that's in deficit has to solve the problem. Keynes' answer was no, the country's in surplus can solve the problem because it has the wherewithal to solve the problem. And the example that I use in the book is the Marshall Plan. What happened after the Second World War? There was only one country that could run a trade surplus, the United States. So what happened? The United States gave X, million doll X billion dollars to Europe so that they could buy more exports from the United States, built up Europe, created jobs in Europe, and created jobs in the United States. Export industry exploded in the United States. Nine million men and women were coming out of the armed forces. They got jobs in the export industry. So there's a case where Keynes' principle, let the surplus countries solve the problem. The question is, how do you let them? And that's an institutional arrangement. I'll stop here and ask if there's any questions. Or have I convinced you all? Ah, no questions, huh? Are there any questions? I have, I have, uh, I if, uh, if, if nobody else uh, wants to, and since we're um, in Chicago, the, the, the back of uh, free market economics, um, I, I, I just, you know, want your thoughts on, um, about government intervention, um, and isn't part of the question about government intervention or non-intervention having to do with the effectiveness of the government intervention, and, and the, the issue around, um, the kind of knowledge that government or central plan would have. I mean, it's the, the von Mises high kind of critique of the yeah. individuals having more information about their own preferences, opportunities, and balance, et cetera. Yeah, I'm in trouble with the, uh, the individuals don't have the income. Now, you're quite right. Government employees, the government has to make good decisions. Mm -hmm. I was a guest of the Communist Party in, in uh, Germany uh, before the wall came down, and I had to give a talk similar to the talk I'm giving now. And we, one of the things that we went into a department store in Berlin, and there was a guy sitting by the elevator on a chair, and we got into the elevator, and he wouldn't get up to move the elevator, and it was one that you needed. And I told this to my Communist Party affiliate. I said, hey, what happened? He says, well, it's very simple. In the, our system, we pretend to pay them, and they pretend to work. So you, you, you st it's quite true, you have to have an incentive to get them to work and you have to design good policies, but you've got to understand what the policies is, what liquidity is, and so on. Keynes did provide this framework for understanding good, why doesn't fiscal policy work? Why did Obama kill no multiplier? Very simple. You gave people, uh, I, I, I sent this up to Obama with somebody, I won't mention who, he never listened to it. Uh, 40% of his stimulus was tax cuts, payroll tax cuts and so on. Uh, what are the people who get payroll taxes back or something, what are they going to do with it? A, we told them they have too much consumer debt, so they were going to pay off the consumer debt. And B, they're going, if they had any money to spend, they went over to Walmart and bought stuff made in China. So the jo whatever jobs fiscally you created was almost all in China. The only thing is you may have created another cashier's job in Walmart, most likely you just increase the size of the line trying to get out of Walmart. So part of the problem is the openness of the economy. And that's why you need the Keynes plan to deal with this problem. 
so that the, the Keynes argued that you have to be able to set your interest rate independent of any international aspects. So that means that capital controls have to be in, involved. You have to be able to limit flows of capital. It's a whole different system. But it works beautifully, at least in theory. And between 1948 and 1968, almost every country in the, United, in the world had capital controls, including the United States. And the golden age of economic development, according to Irma Edelman, was from, 19, from the end of the Second World, 1947, to 1973. GDP growth per capita in both the developed and underdeveloped world was higher than it has ever been before, even under the gold standard, and it's higher since. So I think the theory works. And I'd love to see it tried out, but <laughs> so far I've not been very successful. Yeah, um, there, I mean, as you know better than I do, that the Keynesianism was somewhat discredited in the 70s in the period of stagnant. Uh, inflation and stagnation at the same time, which wasn't supposed to happen, according to what you said. Uh, but it did happen, it happened at a fairly deep, uh, at fairly deep levels. Can you explain that? Or was, sure. that a, was that a failure of Keynesianism? Was it a failure of something it's, else? It's, a, it's a, in the book, but Keynes had two theories of inflation. One he called commodity inflation, the other was income inflation. Uh, commodity inflation is if the price of commodities on the commodity market suddenly rises like oil or gold, or, uh, what you have to do for that is maintain a buffer stock. Uh, the first George Bush, we, we have a strategic petroleum reserve in the United States, which is 99% filled. When uh, Desert Storm broke out, the, uh, everybody started speculating again, the price of oil was going zooming up because you're going to cut off Iraq. George Bush told the uh, Department of Interior to release oil from the strategic petroleum reserve most of you, if you remember, price of oil hardly moved at all because you have a buffer stock to prevent it. After the Second World War, we had agricultural buffer stocks as well. The second one is what about producible goods, not, not ones that are already produced, but future production. That's an income inflation. A cost is always somebody's income. Health costs are going to rise. Everybody agrees to that. Why? Because somebody's income is going to rise. You have to control somebody's income to prevent costs from rising. We, uh, Kennedy had the wage price controls, okay? And during, throughout the 60s, wages and prices and inflation were practically negligible. Even Richard Nixon introduced wage and price controls, and while they were on, kept prices stable. As soon as they were off, zoom. Unions, particularly, I, I used to talk to unions and they would throw me out because I'd tell them, you cannot ask for wages that exceed productivity, otherwise you're going to have inflation, okay? Now, uh, one of the things that Reagan did was destroy unions, which was causing the inflation of the 1970s. We had a real contract. Uh, in, in Chicago, everybody enters into real contracts, not money contracts, right? Well, well what did the labor unions in Detroit and, and in Steel and so on do? They had cost of living uh, clauses in their contract, which said if prices go up, my wages go up. So it's a real wage contract, not a money wage contract. And that, so once the OPEC raised the price of oil, that set off wage inflation, which set off more price inflation, which set off more wage inflation, until Paul Volcker came in and said, that's it, I'm going to end that by creating 11% unemployment and well, unions are going to have a hard time. And then Ronald Reagan came in and the first people that went on strike, the air traffic controllers, he said, you're fired. And after that, it was socially acceptable to fire union people. See, up until that, it was socially unacceptable. And if you look at the unions since then, they've been going downhill. Chicago teachers just had a strike. What's the solution? Washington. What's the solution? Get rid of the teachers' union. They only protect poor teachers, and they ask for waging. After all, how much does productivity in this in the schoolroom increase? Right? Mitt, Mitt Romney wanted the automobile people to go through bankruptcy and restructuring. Why? In a bankruptcy, all the contracts avoided. Got rid of the unions. We'll get the, the workers to want a job instead of ha having a job and that will keep their wages down. So that's the solution. 
do we, do we put labor, unions or non-unions, into the position where they have no bargaining power, or do we say you have bargaining power, but it's limited to what is civilly accepted? Does that answer your question? No, most people don't want an income policy, but that's what it is. The stagnation and inflation to the excess power of unions, that it wasn't somehow controlled in a properly nuanced way. Is that what you're saying? That I'm saying that the inflation part was, and then the government, in order to fight inflation, and the central bank rose, raised, in, you know, the prime interest rate went over double digits. Yeah. So we created a recession in order to push labor into being more genteel. Right? Now, one, one final thing about labor, if I can. If we allowed, uh, now Chinese keep the workers in their place, at least in manufacturing, you know, uh, so uh, you outsource and so on. If we allowed China to build a factory in California and allowed it to operate it the way it operated in China with child labor, working 60, 70 hours a week, no occupational safety protection, polluting the atmosphere and the environment and so on, which is what they do in China. The US law, which are civil laws, would say that factory cannot work here in the United States. They can't sell anything, they can't produce. But if it's over in China, let them go, okay? So if you're gonna have competition, Ultimately, we're going to have child, we, American, work, American entrepreneurs could easily outsell Chinese if we allowed them to use child labor and no occupational safety, no pensions, no Social Security, right? I mean, Romney wants to get rid of the Social Security part anyhow. Uh, and they, they would have less shipping costs, so they could easily outsell the Chinese. Why don't we let American entrepreneurs, who are brilliant men, job creators, why don't we let them build factories with sweatshops? We used to have sweatshops in the United States. Because it's repulsive. Because it's... Morally repulsive. Yeah, it's uncivil. We believe that workers deserve a civilized uh, a set of environment. Well, if they have no other turfs, what are they going to do? If, the, if that was it, you, you have, there's 23 million, Mr. Romney keeps saying, there's 23 million people unemployed. Hey, we open up a factory, you can hire all 23 million of them. How many of the 23 million are going to turn it down? And we don't give them any unemployment compensation either. See? Either you work or you starve. It's your personal responsibility to do it. Don't you think we could restore sweatshops? Easily. Easily. Do we want to? Well, but then how do we protect ourselves from, after all, the sweatshop worker in China has a better standard of living than when he was on the farm. So he thinks this is great. And of course, in this old sweatshops in the old days, people, who were, who were the laborers in the sweatshops in the old days in New York and so on? They were the immigrants who came over from Europe who, gee, that was a wonderful job to be in a sweatshop. I think it's about time. Uh, Professor Davidson, thank you very much. How, let me just ask, how many people have, have I at least raised some doubts with? Nobody, okay. <laughs> All right, let me say one further thing about Milton Friedman, then I'll let you go because you, you'll like this. Milton Friedman and I had a debate in the literature and general political economy in the 1970s. And when uh, Gerald Ford, we were having this horrible inflation in the 1970s. Gerald Ford held a, invited 700 economists to a meeting to tell him what to do about inflation. And Milton and I happened to sit near each other. And I, and I said, I was work, teaching at Rutgers at the time, and I asked Milton, you were an undergraduate at Rutgers University, weren't you? Yes, I was. Where was your dormitory? He said, Weinitz Hall. I said, well, that's interesting. Weinitz Hall is where the economics department is located now. Where in Reinhardt's Hall was your room? And he said, well, I went up the stairs, so and so and so and so. I said, Milton, that's my office. And so I built up a big sign, Milton Friedman slept here. In my <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much.